Before our worship this morning, we follow a divine service setting free the non communion portion of that service. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O oh, most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit increase in us to knowledge you and of your will and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, he gives power to become the children of God, and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen. Please take in hand the worship insert sheet from the bulletin. There you will find the introit for this fifth Sunday after Pentecost. Let us read the intro responsibly, the congregation taking the indented one. <clears throat> the Lord is merciful and gracious. The so soul is anger and how he can set that soul. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like the flower of the field. For the wind passes over it and it is gone. And his place is no but the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear Him. And His righteousness to children's children. To those who keep His covenant. And remember to do His commands. The Lord has established His throne in the heaven. And His kingdom rules over all. Let's say together, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is merciful and gracious. So is anger and allow me to set it as well.
cause all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that, by, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Yet he has no root in himself, 
but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This is the Gospel of the Lord. <laughs>
you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for our message this morning is our epistle lesson, Romans chapter 8, verses 12 to 17. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, but live according to the flesh, or if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, the sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and of children and heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. This is our time. Dear friends in Christ Jesus, when I read this epistle lesson for today in preparation for the sermon for this morning, I was reminded of a play that my niece was in this past fall over in Midland, Mark Twain's classic tale of the prince and the pauper. In case you, by some remote chance, uh, may be unfamiliar with the story, let me simply say it is the tale of two boys who look remarkably alike. One is a prince who is bored by a structured life of excess, and the other is a pauper who is tired of begging for scraps and dreams of better things. They meet by chance and decide to switch places. Both of them get quite an education, which is what makes the story so compelling. Seeing how the poverty-stricken pauper struggles being at the top, not knowing how to act. Or seeing how the prince's eyes were open to what it means to be poor, forced into poverty, dominated by cruel parents. He was in line for everything, and yet he lived as a slave. Now, I bring up the story of the Prince and the Pauper because it reflects what we see happening a lot in the world and in the church today. In the world, we have spiritual paupers, people who have no faith, who have no claim to the blessings of heavenly sonship because they have no nor are they interested in any relationship with God. And yet they seem to be the princes who are continually enjoying the so-called good life. On the other hand, many Christian princes, men and women, who by faith have been adopted into God's kingdom, are living like slaves, afraid of condemnation, feeling like they are forced to earn whatever meager blessings they receive, and not enjoying the inheritance that is theirs. Addressing this problem in our text for today, the Apostle Paul, declares that we are God's heirs. We're not slaves, and that we should live and enjoy the blessings and benefits that the Holy Spirit gives us. Now, as I said, there are many paupers in this world pretending to be princes. In Mark Twain's story, the pauper didn't really think about the consequences of switching places with the prince. No, all he wanted was to indulge in every material pleasure that he could get his hands on. And that's exactly the way some people are today. They don't really give a thought to the eternal consequences of their actions. Death is something that's always happening to someone else, not to them. And the whole notion of hell, it's left at nowadays as nothing more than a fairy tale invented to try and scare people into doing the right thing. People live purely for what they call the good life, pursuing what this world has to offer, whether it be pleasure, possessions, power, or popularity. People want it all. The nicest house, the newest gadgets, the fastest cars, all the best things money can buy. And yet, like the character in the story, they are still just paupers, not princes. Having rejected God's grace, none of what they think they have is real. None of it is going to last or endure. 
In the end, they have no inheritance. In the big picture of eternity, they will die forever lost in the sins of the good life, consigned to the torments of a place they were told did not really exist. But so many people are deluded into this type of mindset and lifestyle is sad and it's tragic. But equally so is the fact that in the church today there are many princes who are acting like paupers. Christians who are free to live for Christ but who instead are living like slaves. These are people who believe that being a Christian means a ticket to heaven when you die but feel that living the Christian life is a lot like hell on earth. These are people who have forgotten about the inheritance that is ours as God's children or that the blessings from that inheritance belong to us right here and now. Instead, these people live their lives in constant fear. They go to church in fear. They contribute their offerings in fear. They serve God in fear because they're always feeling guilty, expecting to be punished. They don't see themselves as free. In fact, although they wouldn't come right out and say it, their view of God is a sort of a stern, severe taskmaster. They don't serve him out of love, they serve him out of fear that something bad will happen if they don't. Life becomes a quest to try and earn God's favor, always in fear of condemnation. Like the prince who had it all, but allowed himself to experience poverty and quickly regretted it, many Christians are sons and daughters of God, with all the rights and privileges our Lord offers, and yet they live their lives as paupers and slaves. What a messed up picture this is. People trying to earn God's favor through the law. It cannot be done. Paul writes earlier in Romans chapter 8, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. You see, living like a slave, thinking that by doing so you can escape God's condemnation is not only unattainable, it is totally unnecessary. Look at what Paul says in our text. For if you live by the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Living by the Spirit means that we have adoption as sons. When you stop and think about it, adoption means something very important. It means that we became God's children, not by our own doing. It's not because we were smart enough, strong enough, and certainly not righteous enough. We are God's children because he adopted us, which means he chose us. Why in the world would you want to live as a slave? constantly in fear, struggling to earn the favor of God, when you already have that favor. The good works we do cannot possibly earn us one bit of God's love. We already have that love. Never forget that God shows us by His grace. Grace means God's undeserved love to us, borrowing the words of Martin Luther, without any merit or worthiness in us. This adoption relationship is one of freedom. Again, Paul writes, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons. We are paupers and slaves. We are no longer forced to serve. We are no longer living in fear of condemnation. We are no longer trying to earn God's favor. Instead, through the Holy Spirit, we can boldly call God our Heavenly Father. We can cry out, Abba, Father, and know beyond a doubt that as our text declares, this is the Holy Spirit Himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And don't forget, that being a child of God means more than just a ticket to heaven when you die. It means blessing and the fullest life imaginable, right now. Being a child of God carries with it certain rights and privileges. 
as Paul says, we are heirs. Heirs of God and, co and fellow heirs with Christ. But I want to ask you is, what exactly does that mean, to be a fellow heir with Christ? It means that we share in the forgiveness which he purchased and won on the cross. So punishment and condemnation are gone forever. It means that we share in the victory over the grave which he accomplished on that first Easter morning. So that means we never have to fear death or what awaits us on the other side of the grave. These blessings are part of a relationship with God that we enjoy now. We are heirs now. It drives me nuts when people talk about the Christian life as a life of hell with the promise of heaven at the end. It's not like that at all. Our inheritance will be wonderful in heaven, to be sure. But that inheritance is already ours here on earth. We share in Christ's forgiveness now, so we no longer have to endure guilt and condemnation. We share in Christ's power now, so we don't have to go through life feeling helpless and afraid. We share in the Holy Spirit's peace now, the peace that surpasses all understanding, the peace that doesn't take away all the struggles and conflicts, but helps us to know we are safe and secure even in the midst of them. We are princes in God's kingdom with all the blessings and benefits that means. So don't live your life as a pauper, but as the prince you really are. Enjoy the spiritual blessings that God offers to you now. There is, however, something I feel needs to be emphasized. As I just said, we can have peace even in the midst of struggles and conflicts. Even a prince's life is not without its share of trials and suffering. The cross is a part of our life, just as it was a part of our Lord's. There are times of pain and suffering during which God gives us his strength and peace and hope. As Paul would write in the very next verse after our text, I consider that the sufferings of this present time, so Paul is acknowledging that there are indeed sufferings, that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. When you run headlong into sufferings in your life, remember that you are a son, not a slave. A slave has nothing he can do about suffering. He's stuck. We are sons. We can call upon our Heavenly Father in any time of need. Call on the name of the Lord. Tell your Father what you need. Make use of the gifts the Spirit offers you. Do you need more strength? More peace? More hope in your life? Then don't neglect to hear and read God's Word. Don't neglect to receive Christ's body and blood in the Lord's Supper whenever it is offered. And don't forget, every day when you look in the mirror, that you are a baptized child of God. In all of these ways, our Lord's arms are outstretched to us, offering us forgiveness, strengthening our faith, and filling us with the blessings we need for each new day. Don't ever neglect the many benefits we have as princes in God's kingdom. So while many spiritual paupers in our world today may seem to be living like princes, and many who are princes in God's church may seem to live like paupers, let us never ever lose sight of the fact that we are adopted children of God. And by that adoption, we are not only God's children, but also heirs. Heirs of eternal salvation in the future, and heirs of blessing right now that come through knowing Christ. May we never serve the Lord with the attitude of a slave, feeling forced or fearful. Instead, let us have the attitude of grateful children, showing our love and appreciation for the Father who has done so much for us. Paupers, <coughs> princes, slaves, or sons, the choice of how you are going to live your life is up to you. Amen.
And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, may it keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. <coughs> Let us rise for prayer. In our prayers this day, we ask God's blessing upon a number of our members uh, and those close to our members who are going through physical needs at this time. We pray for Jan Walter, who's having some physical problems and had tests last week. Marco Cohn and Mary Schlicker, both of whom are hospitalized at this time. Gail Beanlander, who was recovering from hip surgery last week. Vita Henry, who is still recovering from the car accident that she was in. Peggy Avery, the mother of Mike Avery, who is undergoing radiation. And Jim Hoff, who has slowly been making some progress or feeling better and getting stronger. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for adopting us to be your children. Guide and keep us so that we do not put too much value on the things of this world, but always seek your will in our lives. Help us to rid our lives of fear that we must earn our favor with you. Instead, always look the cross of your Son before our eyes, so that we might continually be assured of the forgiveness, life, and salvation you so freely give. Father of all mercy and grace, we ask you to continue to watch over our members and those loved ones of our members in their various physical needs. Be with Jan, Barbara, Eric, Dale, Vida, Peggy, and Jim. Continue to heal and strengthen them according to your plan for their lives. Guard and keep their faith strong so that they may confidently look to you in every time of need and be assured of your constant loving presence. Lord, these petitions, as well as others that we carry on our hearts this day, we now bring before your throne of grace as we pray the prayer your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated for our next thing. <coughs>
invite you at this time to share a handshake with the people around you. But wish them a good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Otherwise, I commend to your reading 